All right, I call this meeting of the Coke Hill City Council to order for this rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. except for to say the sad situation, the jail continues on. The merciful uh, good news is that even though we've only got 49 jail beds, uh, with the weather being so bad, crooks don't like to stick around so much when the, the river's high and the rains are heavy. But as the weather gets better, I expect the situation with the jail to get increasingly worse. And sadly, there seems to be no answers on the table for my friends at the county at the present time. But I know our business owners are going to keep being vigilant, and our Chamber of Commerce is going to be vigilant. And uh, if you're concerned at all about anything, just call the top. Uh, you know, even if even if it turns out to be a small thing, just don't be afraid to pick up the phone and call one of our officers that are there to help. Um, all right, let's go on to council comments. Um, I'll start with Councillor Graham. No comment. All right, points for Brett. Um, uh, Councillor Eaton. Okay, well, I'll fill in. <laughs> uh, I uh, helped with carousel move from uh, downtown to the Jefferson School, and it was quite quite an um, undertaking. I need to congratulate Linda for overseeing that. I would have pulled my hair out, but everyone worked hard. Um, also, the Garden Club, which meets tomorrow in the small auditorium at 1, last month had a speaker on the CERT, the Community Emergency Response Team. And I did that course um, some years ago when it was pretty new. Now you get a whole bunch more goodies and a whole bunch more information. So I would urge everyone to take that CERT course. Um, I went to the Senator Merkley uh, reception and talk at Myrtle Point School and um, enjoyed that very much, especially the questions that the kids had for the Senator. I thought they were very uh, well thought out. Um, I helped weed around the clock tower with the members of the garden club and it just about turned out into a mud wrestling because we were wrestling with mud um, there, but we, we got some of the weeds out and it should be a beautiful place this spring. And um, went to the Chamber of Commerce where Ben talked about um, the downtown area and, and that was very well done and well thought out as well, Ben. That's it. All right. So you can see Council President Weiss isn't with us. Uh, he's out of town on vacation, and he'll be back with us soon. Uh, Councilor Chappelle? No comment. Uh, Councilor Schroeder? Well, I think Susan and I must do a lot of the same thing, except I don't plant flowers. So I, I didn't do that, but I did go see Senator Merkley and the carousel. I guess up at Jefferson School. So we will be getting the word out as to uh, what the days are going to be open, and we'll be having lots of classes, and we're going to do a lot more advertising. So. Uh, please, you know, ask any of us, and we will be putting it in, in um, down in downtown in the windows and things. And we have a display in Kathy's window now, and we're going to be doing a couple of other windows that we'll be putting the carousel and all the other things to help the carousel. So, anyway, please, any questions, give us a call. Thank you. All right, thank you, Linda. Um, oh, I thought you had a question right there, Dave. I was looking at your hand over. Uh, Councillor uh, Kay Martin. Speaking of flowers, I had a red tulip blooming. And so I went out to look at it the other day and see where the others were. The deer ate oh. down all the ones that were coming out. Their little noses went right down in there and they ate all the new stems. So I probably won't have any tools this year. But um, I've been really busy. Our national president from Alaska is coming for VFW in April, and so I've been really busy working on all the VFW things. Went to conference at Newport last year, the last week, and uh, Miss Coos County is coming this Saturday night. Judy has tickets until Friday, so if anyone wants to go see Miss Coos County, there's lots of girls running. Um, and, in a large auditorium? It's at Hale's Performing Arts. It's what? always at Hale's Performing Arts. There's 
like 600 states there, I think. So um, it's always a good show, a lot of fun. Um, and then I went to Bay, well, three of us went to the, several of us went to Bay Fun Festival Saturday night and talked to lots of people and well, lots of different improvements for their area. So, anyway, that's all. I'm just busy. Thank you, Fran. Uh, let's go to staff reports. As you can see, Chief Blue's not with us. Mr. Duffner's not with us, and Mr. Urban's not with us, but we've got their written reports, so if any members of the council have any questions regarding their departments, I know Ben will do his best to answer them. Um, so are there any questions regarding the finance, police, or public works reports? I know that's sort of a catch-all, but, um, you know, uh, they're in the packet. We've had time to read them, so if there are questions, now's the time. All right, then, hearing none, we'll move on to uh, the library director's report. Uh, Director Connor. Thank you very much. You have my report in front of you. This is a very exciting night for me. The construction committee, which had representatives from every area of the city, met and looked at the proposals that we got for our pre-design and made their recommendation to the foundation board. Foundation Board made their recommendation to you, and it's in your packet to act on tonight, if you choose to do that. I, in my report, we have a complete staff. We have two wonderful new workers at the library, Tina Hallmark and Lori Gunther. They're friendly, intelligent, and very effective, very efficient working in the library, and we all get along really well. So come in and see us helping you. In my report, I talk about how one of our uh, disks in our server has, the storm did not cry it. It was defective. Uh, I bought it last <coughs> November, and it was under warranty. I sent it back to the company, and I just, at 5.30 tonight, got word from them that indeed it was a defective disk and they are going to replace it in three to five days. This morning, what? This morning is when I talked to our IT guy and he, an information technologist for the county system and he's now working at the Bandon Library. He's going to finish that up maybe this week. He's redoing everything, which really needs to be done. We're so outdated. So it might not be next week, it might be later <coughs> before you can install that because it will involve reconfiguring the hard drive. Our people have been so, so wonderful about living with that access to the internet at the library. Our Wi-Fi still works and if they bring their own devices they can get on the internet. But they have been very pleasant about the fact that yes, our computers are still down and you can't get on the internet. The Friends Foundation welcomes anybody that wants to come and help us sort all of our books to get ready for another book sale. That's going to happen on Saturday, February 20th. One of the perks, if you help sort, is if you see anything you want, you can buy it right then and there. <laughs> and Team Trivia, we found a theme for it. The Land of Oz. The Wizard of Oz is going to be the theme. That's not what the questions will be. That's how you dress up. That's how you decorate your table. It'll be fun. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Well, I've already got a reserved name for a team, which is uh, Scarecrow's No Brainers. So. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. Now, now, now. See, we have to. We're going to be. So I got to make it a lane my claim to that one now. The winning, the, the winning, the winning team name also gets a prize. All right. As Matt knows. Forgive me, Councilor Heaton. That's that's all right. Um, last year, we had a circulation of six thousand seventy one. This year, it was down about a third. Is there some reason? I think it's, I think it's people are using their e-books. In that count, it does not include how many books are being essentially borrowed from the library but downloaded from our e-book collection to which we subscribe. 
And I think that's part of the reason. I think our circulation is going up now that our internet is down. People are coming into the library and reading. It's very strange, but it's nice to see. Oh, and I know that sometimes from month to month also I'm being on the library board. And it's funny, you sometimes have these variations where there's no consistent reason why there is a fluctuation, but in the end, yeah. I think our circulation was actually up last year. Yes. By yes. the end of the year. It evens out. So it's on. It's interesting how the, the waves come there. Um, all right. Uh, anything else for the library director? All right. Hearing none, then we'll move to the fire chief's report. What do you got for us, chief? Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. Good evening. I'd just like to highlight one thing on uh, my report. Uh, Saturday, February 27th is our 19th annual Pancakes for Life. Um, I'm really happy and glad to, to say over the last 18 years, Coquia Fire Department's been able to donate uh, close to $30,000 to the Burn Center for Children at Emanuel Hospital in Portland. Uh, that would not be um, uh, able to do that without the citizens' support of uh, such a great uh, event. So I'd just like to invite everyone to come down. Uh, we're not going to cancel it for many, many, many years. So whatever we make, we're going to donate to the kids up there. As, as you all know, uh, about a year and a half ago, we did have one of our Coquille kids uh, go up there. And uh, we're just blessed to be able to uh, have money up there to hopefully uh, offset some of his costs and surgeries and stuff. So now how, much, how much does it cost? Uh, it's uh, five dollars for adults and three dollars for kids. And what do you get? What do you get for your five dollars? Uh, all you can eat pancakes, ham, <laughs> eggs, and mayors are big pancakes. I know they are. I know they are. I'm on the news. Orange juice, coffee, coffee melt. Yeah, there you go. Oh, but uh, but no, no. I'll still get my money's worth even if I do have to pay double. But uh, it's a great event. It helps a good cause. I welcome every. I, I hope everybody comes out to this. I know we uh, we have an event also uh, later that night that I'm sure Kathy Simonetti will plug, uh, which is our chamber dinner. And so there's lots of cool stuff to do that day in Coquille, and uh, you can help out a great cause. Uh, now I know uh, we talked at the last meeting about uh, the whistle or the horn or whatever you want to call it at. At the at the fire hall, um, I know Gene Ivy's been collecting signatures and some stuff uh, to that regard. Uh, do you have your surveys there? Yes. You want them now? And yeah, I just assume address the GP uh, the, the whistle the, uh, right now when we got the fire chief. Yeah. Oh, I know, but I'm, we're still I'm dealing with. I just want to deal with the fire uh, chief before we get to this. I just want to address this. Uh, all right. Yeah. So what do you got there for us, Gene? Um, we have never had so many people be interested in a subject as the whistle. Mm -hmm. We had over 200 people come into the office. The first few days, I put it in the paper, and the first few days, we didn't think of having them sign something. Mm -hmm. So the third or fourth day, we thought, oh, well, well maybe we'll make these little things for people to sign. So, so it's more than this, because we missed those first days. but. Uh, there are over 200 here, and most people took the time to write something on it. There, what they used to do at the mill, or why it's dear to them, and it's just one of the most dear things that has happened since I've been here. So I, um, some people even wrote it. And it's good. It's just. Right. I'll circle beside the list around a little bit. And um, the results were, I'm assuming, overwhelmingly in favor of the whistle, or what? Because you didn't say what the general skew of the results were. The general skew, well, I separated those into packets so you could all look at them. And there are no, um, you know, they're all, we didn't copy any. They're all just, each packet is different. But uh, as I was doing that, I of course did have to notice there are two no's and then 220 yeses and <laughs> so there's your answer well, it's actually the council's answer so. yeah. yeah well you know um, uh, markers were really interested in that you know when their fathers passed away in Aldo but he worked on that too for a long time there's a letter. There's a letter in there from um, what's his name that used to be the attorney here at the time, Al and, Walsh. and he Al Walsh, and he told he tells about 
that, Down and it's road. included yeah. in that. Could you read that? Well, yeah, one one of those packets is right on top, and it says Al Walsh letter. One of you has that. That's mine. Okay, maybe you could. Dave, has that Walsh letter been tested for its decibel level? Uh, never has. No. Actually, this runs off of um, air out of a thousand gallon tank, where at GP it actually ran off of steam. But we've never had decibel checks on it, no. Um, if I may. Well, sure. Gene, when I first came to town, of course the whistle was there and sounded. And it sounded, I think, at 10 o'clock in the morning. And I would have my mid-morning cup of I know. coffee. And then it would sound at noon, and I would have you lunch. You knew when to have lunch. And then it would sound at 5, and I would have my glass of wine. But you know what? I can do the coffee, the lunch, and the wine without it. Oh. So I'm, I, <laughs> I'm, uh, I think the quiet is better than the, the siren. Well, I, I just have to tell you, I have never had so many people read some of those, Susan, okay. and you'll, you might change your mind. Uh, and I've heard from a number of citizens about this too. Uh, I'm not sure some members of the council have heard about this too. Um, this impresses me. This is uh, public participation in the in the city government. Um, is there a, um, do you need a motion on this or uh, or just a general consensus of the council? <laughs> oh, that's uh, the friend wants to read it and share. You want me to read it? Yeah, if you'd like to. Okay, this is from Al Walsh, who used to be an active attorney, he's retired now, but he said regarding the GP whistle, and it's to address to Jean, you probably know all of this, but if not, it might be of interest. I was the attorney for the Coquille Rural Fire District for many years. We had a member on that board, also for many years, named Aldo Marcus Sr., now deceased. After the GP mill was raised, Aldo started a one-man campaign to have the whistle installed at the fire hall. It was not an easy task, and there was some dissension, but he persevered. He felt strongly that since GP had been such a prime presence in Coquille through the years that it was a fitting tribute, I believe the current fire chief, Waddington, might be able to fill in some of the trials and tribulations since its installation. I would, I would like to know, um, Chief, apparently it went out, and have you gotten estimates on resurrecting it? Uh, not not price-wise, but we believe the, the timer and the valve up at the uh, top of the tote or hose tower, uh, we'd have to replace that valve and the timer. My rough estimate would probably be close to maybe five hundred dollars to try to get that up and, and running for that. Myself and the retired uh, fire chief McHugh uh, put that in about probably 1992-93 at the station. The rural board did step up. We didn't have an air compressor for any of our trucks or any of our air type tools, and so uh, the rural board. Um, with the contingency that we were to blow the whistle, we'd get an air compressor with the station. And so we obliged to be able to do that. Um, uh, yeah, definitely overwhelming with the, the yays for it. But uh, I definitely do hear uh, when it was blowing a lot of nays from people just walking around. Uh, I think I could address Councillor Graham's uh, concerns maybe about a decibel level. Um, it's very loud as far as U.S. Bank. Uh, Coquille Automotive. Um, I had the misfortune of being up on the roof one time and the crowd it was <laughs> close to noon. Um, and that was, that was a shocker uh, for that. But uh, I'd be more than happy to do whatever the council wishes to do. Um, we've even talked about, you know, is there somewhere else that uh, a group could take that, uh, be in charge of that. Um, but everything is in place at the station now. 
to be able to do that. So. Okay, you lower the vessel. I don't know that. Probably with just with the valve. Probably how much air comes through that valve. Mm -hmm. It's actually a uh, about a two inch line that goes up to the um, uh, horn itself, mm -hmm. and uh, for seven seconds that the whole tank opens up and takes the. the thousand gallons of air and just rushes up to that so uh, based on probably the valve that we put in you probably could lower that but I'm not an expert on that so well that's oh, sorry did you have something Dennis I could know oh, I know as deaf as I am I've been downtown when that thing goes off it'll wake you up either way <laughs> how about a lawsuit so, you know something like an heart attack you heard about that the liability well Gina, I think, should be congratulated for an effort, but I wonder if another person against the horn put out the same effort would get equal wait, or more. Wait, wait, I, I think you're whoa, 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 mistaken. I, I, I can't have the, the, the back and forth like this from the audience, Gina. I, well, I, it I wasn't, appreciate what you've done here, but... It wasn't an effort on my part. I just put in what you what you guys said last last meeting, and I'm, I promise, what, I mean, it wasn't an effort. Well, no, that, that's fair. No, I'll, I'll let, I'll, I'll, I appreciate your comment there, Gene. I understand where you're coming from, Susan. That said, I did say I'd like to have a vote on this. So if there's any, I mean, you know, we'll see, uh, the people will see what uh, the council pleases to do on this. So is there any motion uh, at all to uh, uh, fix the whistle? I make a motion that we fix it and have it reinstalled. Councilor Chappelle makes a motion. Is there a second? Councilor Kate Hart you seconds. You bet. Uh, discussion. Yes, I'd like to see if you get the desk out a little bit then. If you're going to do that. No, I'm all for support. I'm going to go for it, but I would like to see if that's a concern. That, was yeah. that, would, uh, do you want that in your motion, Dave, or do you just want to just go straight to the issue? And if, if, yeah, uh, to lower the decibel level. Well, we don't even know what it is. So I think that that can be a staff discretionary decision removed from fixing the whistle. Um, um, but, um, all right, uh, Fran, did you want to say something? Yeah. Just all for it? Yes. It's just that there's only one no in this packet. What is this one? All right. Most of the people want it. Is there any uh, further discussion? I, I, if, yes, I would like to know if, indeed, before we vote on it, how much it would cost and if you could lower the decibels and table these. <clears throat> oh, no, well, there was, um, um, so you're making a motion to table this, but that's, you made the motion, you seconded it, so if you guys have to consent to tabling it. Uh, um, so, I mean, would you prefer to just address this now? Because I think the people, I mean, in my opinion, deserve to vote. No, I think these people have gone to the point of, of doing this. Gene, you went to the, you went to the, 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 the trouble, I guess for lack of a better term, to, to do this. And people had the option to vote yes or no, period. Okay. Let's just address it now. Let's get it, let's get it taken care of. And in our years on the council, have we ever seen this kind of output? I, I, oh, I think this no. is great. I'd like to say something, too. I think that if this many people are for it, I think it's going to cost you, like, say, $500 or something. Well, I'll I give them $500. I was going to say, I bet people would donate. <laughs> well, you know, donate. People would donate if they feel that's probably oh, yeah. yeah, and that's what I was going to ask. I mean, sure. Does it come out of my fire budget to no. fix that? No, no, or no, no. I think bring you back a cost, and then we find the funds? So, right. And, and we have. Uh, if we've had great citizens. That said, they would step up to help sure. donate. No, I don't think they're coming up the fire fund. I think no. okay. some of us are you good or something. Well, let me just say this. I'll get on the dunk tank again. We could probably at least raise $500 for it. I'll do it. Uh, if we got it, I mean, I'll, I'll raise the money on the dunk tank if we have to. No, I'm not, I'm not gonna. I mean, hell, if you if you need the money, I would. My, my company would be more than happy to give you the five hundred dollars to do this. And this has been what's got me to question where the council stands on this whistle. So um, we still have the motion on the floor. Is there any further discussion uh, to the motion? All right. Um, oh, Chappelle, we need you to vote. I think I know how you're gonna vote. But... I'm for it. Oh, okay. Well, you can you can say aye from over there. Aye. <laughs> okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Uh, opposed. No. So. We have a majority of the council of four voting for it, so it passes. You know what you got to do, and we can come up with the money somehow. I'm confident of that. Thank you, Mayor. Thank All you right. So thank you, citizens. Ben, couldn't that come out of uh, the our city promotions? This is something that all of us that have lived here any for a long time have heard that whistle for years and years and years, and I think that instead of taking it for base budget. 
I think that should come out of city promoters or well, I, I heard money coming from outside of the city. And all that oh, I see. <laughs> well, I don't think we can privately raise our money. If everyone voted yes, I'll kick in two and a half dollars. Oh, he's talking about who filled these up. Um, all right. Um, thank you, Fire Chief. Is there anything else for the Fire Chief? I know we got bogged down in this. I just felt the folks deserved an answer, and the council uh, stepped up. And even if you th didn't vote for it, you gave them an answer, though, and that's all that they could be asked to do. So, um, and again, pancakes for life, February 27th, for a great cause. Show up and uh, get your fill of pancakes. Thank uh, you, sir. All right. Um, um, city manager's report. Uh, ben, anything in addition to your written report? Uh, first, I'm going to jump back to the Public Works Director's report, because in there he did have two grants that he wanted to let the council know about, and um, just is the council desirous of pursuing both those grants? One is <clears throat> to replace the, the boat dock at Sturdivant Park, and we would also pursue uh, funding from Fish and Wildlife that would allow part of the dock to be for fishing, which for years has been fished off of, but the Marine Board hasn't appreciated that. The new dock would be for both boats and fishermen. Uh, the other grant would be a grant with the Oregon State Parks for a trail, uh, specifically up in uh, 100, what we like to call the 100 acre wood behind the Irving and uh, South First. And uh, is that a, a project that we're interested in pursuing right now before we put in for the grant? Tony, go ahead with his deal and give it to the city? Not yet. The, um, so the appraisal came back and it was too low. Uh, there was about a difference of 15000 Uh We communicated back to the agent, well, would he accept payment of the difference? Uh, would that meet their needs? Because we could get that payment funded by the grant for land acquisition. Um, or we could come up with the funds um, somewhere in the city budget and then use that entire amount uh, to as match. And that could leverage quite a bit of state parks money. Uh, so that we, we, I don't think we have an answer specifically on that question yet, but um, the opportunity is definitely there. And I think the the initial reaction was that there's probably a way to figure this out. So they're still encouraging. So you're basically asking about three or four things. Well, two things on uh, these two grants. Should we pursue these grants? OK, so the first one's the Marine Board, one for the new dock. Um, well, uh, could you clarify again the second one? Forgive me there, Ben. The so second one is for a, a trails grant. Up in the 100 acre woods. Okay. So one grant for 100 acre woods, is that going to come out of recreation, state parks, recreation trail program? Yes. How's that going to impact the Riverwalks grant application? Uh, I'm not sure. We have a couple of ideas about that. One, we send a message to Salem that we are very excited about parks and they should invest here. Uh, two, the um, Riverwalk is coming back for its third time to request, and it's due. And this one would just be an introduction to the other trail system. And there's a chance that they could both be funded because, you know, I think the fifteen thousand dollars we'd have to ask for that trail grant would be or it's so insignificant that they might just give it to us. All right, uh, any other uh, council uh, questions regarding the grants? Are there any objections to pursuing either of them? I kind of question the second one. I kind of feel like the same way that, that uh, uh, Dennis does as far as uh, you know, doing another one just because I don't want to take it away from the river walk. So, so one of the rules is one agency cannot have two grants open at the same time. And the thought is that as two separate agencies, the city, independent of the Riverwalk, uh, could be pursuing a separate grant at the same time. And it's really about getting on their radar. Uh, I, I doubt that the one would preclude the other from getting funded. 
uh, at least the river walk. Uh, that's that's our first priority. All right. So you're not looking. Are you? You're not looking for a motion. You're just looking for consensus regarding the grants. Yes. Um, I have no uh, opposition to seeking either of them. I don't know how the rest of the council feels, though. I mean, if you guys want to support one or the other, it's just good to let Bennett kind of know where you're at. Well, I'm all over the dock. Yeah. I think that kind of question would be better. Well, then maybe we uh, need more information on the second one, then. Uh, is, is that what you're thinking? Well, one concern I have is our, our trip master plan, in the last meeting we had, we stated that we need to work on existing parts before we started expanding our park system. And this is contrary to what you know, the Parks and Recreation Committee requested. So. Well, then I think you've got your answer. There's a blessing, there's a unified blessing on the dock. Uh, it sounds like we need more information on the second. Sounds fine. Thank you very much, thank Ben. And, uh, anything else? Yeah. Um, uh, thank you. I <clears throat> did get some notes of some uh, corrections on the emergency preparedness event, but I, I do want to say that that has been very well received in the community. We have uh, three sponsors now. Uh, our signature sponsor is First Community Credit Union at $1,000, and they've already paid. And right behind them are Northwest Natural Gas and ComSpan uh, as silver sponsors. So that's wonderful, and we're getting people excited about this event. It'll be Saturday, April 16th. Uh, I'm sorry, I did not have a, a cost estimate for the improvements on the downtown revitalization plan. Uh, I had some back and forth with Pacific Power and they provided me additional information and uh, I am waiting on the Dyer partnership to get us some estimates on what our share of that cost might be. Alright, Fran, you had something? Yes, yeah, so if you already sent out this, are you prepared? Yes. Well, I can say, mistakes in that. I, I, thank you. And <laughs> I've got them noted, and we'll be correcting and updating it so that if anyone else downloads it off the city's <laughs> website, it'll be correct. All right. Okay, yep. and then one other question I was going to ask Kevin. What's going on on Fairview Route? Yes, uh, Sunday morning, uh, it was found that the road was collapsing. There was an old culvert under the road uh, that had rusted out all through the top and uh, <coughs> it went all the way across the road. Uh, emergency personnel got on it, barricaded the road. Uh, this is going to have a significant impact on our local economy. Uh, I had a call from Milky Way Feed today because they're very concerned about how this is going to impact their business. Uh, they rely on uh, many large truck deliveries each week, uh, about 12. And even though they're, they are at the end of the line for a lot of these trucks, so the trucks aren't fully loaded, they're just making the last drop off at Milky Way feed. But uh, these trucks are too long to legally go down Lee Valley Road and go around. Um, and when a milk truck is fully loaded, 10,000 pounds, it can can't really make it up Hungry Mountain very well. And so they're, they don't have many options, and um, we'll be looking into that further to see if there isn't something we can do to assist them and keep their business on life support. Uh, but this is a county road, and uh, they're also working with the county to see what the county's time frame is for getting it fixed. The biggest obstacle, frankly, is the weather. Uh, it's the water table is very high. The ground is saturated, especially right there. You you can see the the standing water backing up in the field. You can't replace the culvert because you can't get com compaction in wet ground. And so, in order to do the job, they're going to have to wait till it dries out, probably late summer, uh, before you can reset the culverts and and rebuild the road. So. I'm hoping they can find another solution in between time. Uh, Mr. Scaleri suggested there might be uh, a portion of a bridge that they could lay down to bridge the problem, but the continuous concern through the season is going to be the continued erosion from all the wet weather. So that's, that's the situation. All right. Uh, anything else for Ben? Thank you, Ben. And uh, oh, yes. I'll do on his report on the um, municipal judge. 
Yes. Um, have we had any other people interested in that? And no. will we meet anybody who is interested? The, this is the <coughs> best opportunity we've had in two years trying. And uh, this is our pro tem judge uh, who I was originally told about a year ago incorrectly that they were not a bar certified attorney, but they are. And they are interested at this time in uh, serving as the permanent municipal judge for Coquille. And uh, she's going to be here tonight, but uh, Ms. Pat uh, Davis will uh, be here next month and would be happy to talk about her qualifications with the city council. No marvelous. She has experience creating municipal courts, working in municipal courts, and has some ideas on how to help us. In fact, she's already working on them with our city attorney. And by the way, for the folks in the audience who may not know this, everything we're referring to is in this packet, which you can get on the city website or at the library. And so uh, the information on the judicial applicant uh, is there in the packet. Um, it's a lot of useful information, and you can just get it very easily. Um, before we move to co public comment, I need a point of personal privilege. I need a five-minute recess, so we'll reconvene at 7.42. participants, of which approximately one-third were from outside of the Coquilla. There were seven stops on the tour, in addition to other stops such as the farmer's market, where raffles were being held. The raffles attracted participants to see other places of interest in Coquilla. The tour was advertised along Oregon's I-5 corridor and read press releases that reached east to Roseburg and north to Reedsport. Advertisements were placed in newspapers, the Oregon Calendar of Events on Facebook, and with the State Federation of Garden Clubs. Posters were placed in Bandon, Roseburg, Gold Beach, Port Orford, Goose Bay, Lakeside, Reedsport, and Florence. The Garden Tour leadership will be doing some more fundraisings in uh, this coming year and more community events. Uh, they're building a website and uh, they have an active Facebook page. We sincerely appreciate the city's generous grants which support the vitality and beauty of our community. And in the spirit of statistics, this is a letter from the Harvest Market. Dear Ben and the City Council members, most people when they get old they have to put them on, I gotta take them off. <laughs> Operation Coquille is writing to express thanks for the city's generous support of the 2015 Coquille Valley Farmers Market in granting the market access to space for a nominal fee. And I am giving you the status report. The 2015 Farmer's Market was attended by 5,518 customers, many of whom were out-of-town visitors. I know I have a little clicker and I counted everybody. The gross vendor income was $18,293. I know I made them tell me. The market had an average of nine vendors each week. The consignment table was a unique and successful feature of the Farmer's mark Market. The this is where local growers that don't have enough for a booth can participate for a fee. Uh, it, 
brought in over about $900 gross income. So these are thank you letters for City Council, who I give these to. And um, I was also handed some, apparently, some begging things here. What's the protocol for begging things? Do I beg you? There's some begging things. Bye. <laughs> Thank you, Don. You're welcome. All right, um, let's go to, uh, oh, Jean, did you need to say anything besides no, what we already covered? No, that was me. All right, very good. Thank you, Jean. Uh, Suzanne Swan. I just want to say thank you about the whistle. Do I have to go all the way there? No, I think okay. we can count that. That would be fine. <laughs> okay, that's it. Thank, thank you very much. I like the train. And uh, Kathy Simonetti, come on down. <clears throat> Kathy Simonetti, Oak Hill Chamber of Commerce. Uh, um, just kind of bring you a little up to date on the chamber. We have started off 2016, I think, with a bang. We have slotted on our calendars uh, for May 2017 to have Culpepper and Meriwether Circus come to town. Um, talk to Ben about that. We'll give you something in writing as we get a little further on our contract with them. Um, this month we'll start working on our gay 90s. Um, the 27th, Saturday the 27th, we will have our chocolate fantasy coming up. Um, we went to the Bay Area Chamber of Commerce and uh, it was phenomenal. Hopefully ours will be as large as theirs someday and as eventful. The highlight of that evening for me was I got to meet the chief of the Coquille tribe. I thought that was, it was just awesome. He's a very fantastic person. Excellent speaker also. Um, we also have, um, we're starting an emergency uh, or CERT program, uh, a chapter here in Coquille. And I'm um, working with a CERT program on developing a chapter here in Coquille. Uh, we're going to start CERT uh, classes February 16th from 6 p.m. to 8.30. It's an eight-week class. It will be held here in the City Council Chambers. Again, that's starting February the 16th from 6 to 8.30, and it is an eight-week class. Um, if anybody's interested in signing up, uh, we'll have a, you know, you can call the chamber, we'll let you know, or you can contact me at the store, or uh, Ben Marchette has some information on it also. We'll have posters we'll be putting up um, pretty soon. Um, the chamber also has a seat on the transient lodging tax uh, committee, and um, those meetings are going to start again in March, and hopefully, We'll get that to pass uh, this year. Um, ben did a presentation last uh, month in the month of January uh, to the cham at our chamber meeting, and um, we had a great response to Ben's presentation on the underground electrical, and we hope that the city council will keep this project on the work table um, as we look forward to possible ways of making this happen, as we believe that this is the first step to revitalizing our downtown. So we hope that you don't put it on the back burner, that it stays to the front and will hopefully uh, make the agenda at some point. And I think that's pretty much all I have to say. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Kathy. Uh, Janet Reed, do you want to talk? No. All right. Always good to keep your options open. Yeah. All right. And uh, now we've got uh, Martha Gregor, who's with the 15 Now campaign uh, that wants to raise the minimum wage. Uh, and um, there's so much talk about the bills in the legislature and this and that, and I know I've heard people for it and against it and from all sorts of different opinions on the subject. And since we had a light agenda, I thought it'd be nice to uh, give her uh, about 15 minutes to make a presentation on this and then field any questions anybody on the council may have. I know this, we've heard some positives and negatives from local business people, uh, and I just thought it'd be nice to hear some information. So come on down. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here tonight. I really appreciate it. I have a handout. Um, my computer was not uh, feeling like working with that system, so I don't have it it's on a PowerPoint, but this should be clear, and I have it on the document viewer. Wait. Wait. Can you have it on the or are we sharing? Or? No, you can just pass those steps. 
Oh, sorry, oh. I was a substitute teacher, so I'm just like <laughs> about to be picked out and yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. Yeah, I don't actually see everyone in the audience would like one. Yeah, so just take one and pass it around if you like. Um, so as um, Mayor pointed out, I'm um, a member of the group Hold 15 Now Oregon. We're a volunteer-led organization, so we don't have many paid organizers. Um, we have been active in the state for a couple of years now. I've been active in this movement for about a year, and um, I'm from the North Bend, thank you, from the North Bend, Coos Bay area, and moved back a few months ago, and I've been starting a chapter um, here in Coos Bay to advocate for raising the minimum wage to a living wage. Um, many economists consider a $15 uh, minimum wage to be a living wage, which would lift one individual and one child out of poverty. Uh, I know it sounds like a huge jump, um, so that's why I'm trying to get out and talk about this issue. It's going to be phased in over three years. That's what our ballot measure is proposing. We probably have got some counter proposals from the governor and from other groups that uh, are proposing 13.50 for rural areas and um, now 14.42 for Portland metro areas and minimum wage. So there's some discussion about maybe rural areas should be um, have a lower minimum wage than the metro areas, but I would think the case that we need it just as much here in rural areas as we would in the Portland area. So uh, I'm going to go through a little bit of uh, whether th thinking about whether or not Oregon's economy is working. I would argue that it's not because we now have poverty that is higher uh, now during uh, than during the Great Recession, and. There we go, Zoom. Okay. And uh, many of these people are working. And uh, if I have this on the projector, you can see that Coos County's here with very high poverty as well as high rates of government assistance. And 71% um, of children of working poor families have a parent that is working. And about half our government assistance is going to people who are working. So these people are, in many cases, working 40 hours a week or more, working multiple jobs. They're not able to support themselves. We're not just talking about minimum wage workers. We're also talking about anyone who makes less than $15 an hour. So preschool teachers, janitors, uh, most people in retail and in food service are making less than $15 an hour. Farm laborers, of course, in the Valley in particular, are making um, low wages, too. And it's become quite common in our um, rural areas as well as we've transitioned um, to more of a service-oriented economy, particularly on the coast. Probably all of us are aware of how radically Oregon's rural economy has changed in the past few decades. Uh, wages have fallen and benefits have been reduced or have disappeared for many working people. Um, there are fewer opportunities for advancement, so we have a case in which we, people aren't able to be as upwardly mobile as they were in previous decades. Um, so we have about the same availability of low income, low wage jobs, but all the benefits of those are different and the low wage is now very low um, for many working adults. Uh, these minimum wage jobs are no longer just for um, teenagers or for people in their early 20s. We've really seen a shift over the years. Um, back in the 1990s, um, only one in five minimum wage workers was making minimum wage a year after that. And now when they've sampled the general population, um, one in three minimum wage workers are still working for minimum wage a year after that. And the age of people who make minimum wage has also shifted upwards. So uh, now we have 70% of minimum wage earners are 25 years old or older. And the average age is 35. So it, they've really become family wage jobs in a way that they weren't um, prior to the 70s and 80s. Um, Jobs in rural Oregon have um, tended to stratify a little bit, gone down for the lower end, and we still have some high wage jobs, but we kind of have a hollowed out middle class here as our economy has changed. Uh, we also don't have a very diverse economy here. I'm not sure the $15 minimum wage will help with all of that, with diversification, but it will um, help bring uh, money into our economy through higher wages, and low income people are more likely to spend that money in our local economy. Recently, the share of families of working poor has also risen um, by 27.9%, so pretty significant in the past seven years. Um, my concern, and I think the concern of a lot of people in the 
living wage movement is that we're seeing new generations come into poverty that might not be able to get out of poverty if we don't do something to raise wages. So some of these challenges are um, certainly faced by Coos County workers as well as uh, factors that are unique to our rural areas such as the housing shortage that we're enduring right now, lack of affordable child care, um, food insecurity. We're 13th in the nation for food insecurity in Oregon. That's an issue in our county as well. Um, but I also will argue later that uh, some of these challenges that Coos County businesses are facing will also be helped by the minimum wage raise as well. So we've seen a decline in large industries which really help uh, put fuel in our economic engine and they contract out to smaller businesses and they really help generate a lot of economic growth. So we've seen a decline in those industries, um, economic stagnation and a small customer and consumer base. Um, one small business owner who's supportive of this in Coos Bay is, uh, works with her family, works with families a lot. Um, his business serves families and he thinks that there would be a lot more families able to spend money in this area. Um, if we raise the minimum wage, and if you have a lot of working families who are low income here who just don't consume very much, they don't go out to eat very much, they don't spend a lot of money. Uh, we're already paying for low minimum wage right now. You could think of it as um, we're subsidizing a low minimum wage. So your tax dollars are going to working families in Oregon, working families only in Oregon, so exclusive of people who are on government assistance who are not working, receive $1.8 billion in government assistance every year. So Coos County residents in particular, 27% are on uh, food assistance, um, and that has increased even though unemployment has declined um, in Coos County and in Oregon generally, so since the recession. So we still see that these jobs that are being created are not really living wage jobs that people can support themselves on. And um, you know, the poverty threshold for one individual is only a little bit more than $12,000. But I think uh, many people would agree that $12,000 is certainly not enough to live off of um, for, a, for one person for a year or two, or anywhere in the state. So we just see that continued government assistance has become really common, kind of chronic in a way. And um, we're already paying for that just through the system of social services when really people could be um, receiving those wages, they'd be earning them for their labor and not have to be um, dependent on these services. We have a housing shortage in rural Oregon. The vacancy rate in Coos County is less than 3%. And we just have a real shortage of affordable housing here, so that's a challenge that a lot of low-income earners are facing right now. We just don't have a diverse uh, rental market. In the urban market, you have a lot of developers who are um, uh, contributing time and energy to large rental projects. And we don't have that here. We also don't have um, a, robust, a robust housing authority that has a large budget. And uh, some businesses have recognized that this is a really significant issue. So for example, in Tillamook County, um, the Tillamook Cheese Factory contributed $50,000 of the $90,000 budget of that uh, county's housing task force because there was so little housing available for their workers. And they thought, it as, this is a quote, uh, absolutely threatens the viability, end quote, of their company. So they actually contributed most of the budget for their housing authority and the rest was covered by grants just to provide housing in that rural county because it was such a crisis. And we're kind of in a crisis too. I mean, it's not as, uh, quite as dramatic as Tillamook County, but we have, uh, for low-income earners, they have a really hard time finding smaller apartments uh, in Coos County and then being able to afford them because a one-bedroom apartment costs $550 if you're lucky, and that's a week and a half uh, worth of pay if you're a low income earner. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on um, the lack of affordable child care, but that's an issue too. It's extremely expensive. It costs more for child care in Coos County than it does to attend one of Oregon's public universities. So and there's just not a lot of availability here either. So that's a challenge the low income earners are facing in rural areas, more so than in urban areas. So what are the challenges faced by businesses in Coos County? So we have a decline in larger industries that fueled our economy. We have some economic stagnation and we have a consumer base that really does not have the spending power that we could envision for that uh, consumer base. Um, not to put too fine a point on it, there's a picture of downtown Coquille, but if we, we also have a lot of corporations who are uh, operating in Coos County, they can absolutely afford to pay uh, a higher minimum wage, a living wage, and that's 
hundreds of thousands of dollars that are going to be coming into the pockets of Coos County um, workers that they can then spend locally. And economists have really found that it's low wage earners that uh, spend their money locally because they're spending it directly on food, on housing, on transportation. And they're more likely to you know, change their habits in terms of going out to eat more, buying more groceries, things like that. Those are the first things that they do, um, you know, not going online and buying a lot of luxury goods, for example. So you can envision that we, would have, we have actually a lot of these large corporations in Coos County, and that is going to have a measurable impact on our local economy because those people are going to be making a lot more money who work there. I think the big concern for everyone, um, so I'm very interested in questions that people have about this, is what will it do to small businesses? Um, we have data from the past, so this is a 42% minimum wage increase here in uh, 89 to 91, which stays in over three years, and there was no measurable effect on the health of, and growth of small businesses here. This is a 62% increase that we're proposing. So this is a larger increase. Economists. Um, predict that prices will need to go up by about 1%. And so that's not going to, some people will say, well, then prices go up, what's the difference? Well, prices are already going up, and they will need to go up a little bit for businesses to compensate with this, but they're not going to go up to the point where, um, you know, a gallon of milk costs $9 or something like that. They're going to go up in a more reasonable way that people will be able to absorb. So. This is uh, showing how small businesses are hurt more by recessions than by wage increases. They can be benefited by wage increases because they'll have customers who can spend more money at their establishments, too. Uh, so low-wage workers, I've already said, they spend a lot of their wages. Um, the latest studies from UC Berkeley and UCLA are saying that uh, that will create an additional $1.1 one dollar twelve cents of spending money for each doll, extra dollar paid to a low wage worker in our economy because they really think this is going to be an economic boost so that's what economists are saying right now there's also the issue of uh, businesses uh, for example restaurants that are basically in a pattern where they're constantly having to train people because turnover is such an issue so you're going to have lower turnover because people are able to stay at one job and maybe able to work one job instead of several um, they'll be more dedicated and productive and pleased, healthier and happier, be able to better provide for their families. So higher wages have been proven to re decrease turnover. I think there's a lot of businesses who really uh, will see benefits from that because they'll be training people so frequently. There's a, a recent report out from um, the UC Cornell School of Hospitality, and um, they found, they did a 2015, they did a study last year, of minimum wage increases and restaurants, and they found that um, the minimum wage increases um, did not decrease demand or profitability to the extent that restaurants closed or hired fewer people. In fact, they found that minimum wage increases um, reduced turnover and increased employee productivity. So restaurant sales have also been on the rise. Um, projected growth last year, I haven't heard if this was confirmed in Oregon, was restaurant sales went up by 3.2% in our state. So restaurants are um, doing well in general in our state, and I, again, this is uh, something about retaining employees. People who really want to work for those businesses, but maybe feel the pressure of trying to find a job that pays a higher wage. Uh, no, no proven impact on job growth. I haven't been able to get statistics on how many low-wage workers are, uh, work more than one job, but it's anecdotally it's pretty significant. A lot of the low-wage workers that I know work more than one job. They might not have to do that if they we raise the minimum wage, so that will free up some jobs for other people. Um, there's also just been no proven impact or correlation between raising the minimum wage and growth of jobs in area, any area like rural or metro. So we don't think that this is going to be um, creating the catastrophic changes in employment that people are so con that some people are really concerned about. So why 15? Well, $15 an hour, if you're going to significantly raise the minimum wage, we should do it right, and we should really make it a living wage. So over 200 economists in the U.S. have signed a letter to the president saying that they think that $15 an hour is the right number. It's really the amount, um, if you think that's you know, $30,000 a year, so uh, it's really going to pull somebody out of poverty. They'll be able to support themselves and possibly one child. And they'll be able to, for example, go back to school. They'll have money they could possibly save. 
This is really um, the wage that will pull people out of that situation of chronic working poverty and be able to um, give them the opportunities that the American dream has promised for so long to so many people. Um, rural areas do have unique challenges. So the group that I am a part of, and we're very against this idea that rural areas need lower minimum wages. Of course, there are different um, employment patterns in rural areas, but um, there's also unique challenges to those areas that are, are difficult for low-income earners. So we would argue that the same uh, 50 dollars living wage is applicable and beneficial to those areas, too. This is the ballot language. So it will be phased over three years to 2019. And it's going to be on the November 2016 ballot. Uh, looks like we're on track to get all our signatures for it to be on there. So we will um, we'll have enough signatures by July 1st. It's about 120,000. And it will be um, on the ballot during that presidential year. Hopefully there will be a good voter turnout for that. Um, I would love to take any of your questions. I'm very, this is the first time I've really presented about this in this area. We're hoping to do some forum, um, a forum or two this uh, summer to kind of get out the word about this for people who might be on the fence. And I've been canvassing with some people who are interested in it and are supportive of it. But I'm very curious like what kind of questions people would have in this area about it. So I'd like to just open up to any questions that folks might have. All right, got two of you the mic. All right, well, as far as question and answer time, uh, counselors can. And uh, if you want to talk to people afterwards, that's that's Okay, great. Just, all right. We've got a process here. I appreciate you wanting to answer questions. Okay. Uh, does anybody, I mean, uh, almost 50 minutes, a little bit longer, but it was a good oh, sorry. Don't okay. go uh, <laughs> Lots of information to take in. I don't know if anybody has any questions right now, but obviously uh, it's coming. Well, concerns. Okay. That's fine. Yes, Councilor Pinkman. Yes, I have a concern. Okay. I am on a fixed income. Uh -huh. I started working at 14 for 45 cents an hour as a soda jerk. Mm -hmm. um, I... I am concerned that this will raise prices, mm -hmm. and um, my fixed income now, by the way, it's not 45 cents an hour, mm -hmm. um, would be losing ground. Mm -hmm. So, what kind of answer do you have to that? Yeah, well, that is a concern. I think the benefits cliff is not going to be as dramatic as people are concerned about because people have been working on that. And seeing that people, the prices are not going to go up as significantly as people are really worried about because 1% is not that significant for most food items, for example. Um, also, something to keep in mind is the state of Oregon is going to be getting a lot of more income tax revenue and saving money on social services um, from this, million, hundreds of millions of dollars. So I do think that that's an issue that will have to be worked out during the phase in, but the state of Oregon is going to have the money to do something about that, for sure. But that money to the state of Oregon is not going to help me. Well, hopefully, because, I mean, this is something we often continue to advocate for, right? Like, the ballot, the ballot measure is, um, by nature, pretty straightforward and simple in a way. I mean, this is just phasing in a minimum wage over three years. And so during that process, it will be the duty of legislature, legislators, people in the fixed dollar minimum wage movement, we're not going to go away. We're still listening to people and their concerns about this. And we're going to have to work on some of those issues during that time. Any other questions for Martha? No, I think Councillor Heaton's uh, concern is probably the biggest concern a lot of people around here are going to have. And, mm -hmm. and I, you and I have talked about this, Martha. I think the best thing you can do is if you're going to have a wage increase, you need to have take steps to the tax code, the regulatory code, to, to offset those expenses for businesses uh, so that it's not a loss for the business. You don't have the inflationary impact. You need to get that purchasing power for the workers, which is good for business. But I think, you know, and again, the legislature needs to do its job and help some of our businesses out with some regulatory and some tax changes because if this does happen and you have that, you've got a lot of, a lot of economic potential. Uh, so, well, thank you very much for your presentation. Then I'm sure if anybody has questions for you, okay. I'll stick around for after the meeting. Uh, okay, thank you. <laughs> Did Mr. Swan have something to say? No. no. Oh, all right. All right. Okay. I'm happy to talk to people afterwards, too. And I also brought the ballot uh, petition if you want to sign. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Let's move on to um, agenda item 8, accepting quotes for library pre-design report and design. Uh, Anne. I mean, it's all in the packet, but if you want to summarize. <coughs> published the request for quotes in 
a Portland uh, Commerce publication and uh, the local paper <coughs> and received three packets from companies listing their qualifications. I went through those, I, everybody got copies of those quotes and I went through them and made a short and dirty analysis comparing all of them on one page. The, the points that we asked to be covered in the RFQ and those are the ones that we got. That's the information they gave us on, on that summary that you have in your packet. All right. So is there a motion to accept the quotes? I think that we accept all that. Okay, we got like a trifecta there. I, I heard Heaton a lot of stuff, so Councilor Heaton makes the motion. I'm guessing one of those two others will uh, second the motion? Second. Okay, Councilor Graham seconds. Uh, any discussion uh, beyond what we already know? Hearing none then, all those in favor of accepting the quotes, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes uh, unanimously. Well, 6 0. Uh, all right, now the motion to award contract for library pre-design reporting conceptual design. All right. Uh, I move we award project HG Incorporated for the cost not to exceed $21,350. All right, the motion has been made. Is there a second? I second. Councilor Chappelle seconds. Uh, discussion? Hearing none then, all those in favor of awarding the contract say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion uh, carries uh, six zero. All right then. And uh, you said you wanted to say something about the economic uh, redevelopment uh, conversation downtown. Well, it's the good of the order. What do you have? Well, I don't want to let this go. I know that we don't have some of the facts, but you know, right now we have a lot of businesses that do not have heat. We have businesses that do not have correct. Um, can't have. Our, you know, we've talked about this before. You can't have two air dryers on at a time. We have, uh, we saw the roof go, you know, at Wayne Nelson's during the storm. And in fact, we were across the street at the carousel, and all of a sudden that wind came, and we saw this, we saw the roof go up, and we just saw the roof go down. And I know that that's a concern, because they're going to have to do some things to that, and I know they're going to be coming to Urban Renewal. But I know that, you know, Marcy's place, you know, we've had some problems. That's one of the reasons that we moved out of there. I know the Stacy's had to move out. It just seems like there's a lot of things happening downtown, and I know this isn't an easy thing, but I just really think that this might be the time that we kind of think about there might be something that we need to do to kind of go forward for this, you know, to better this town. It's going to be a little hard to do, and that's why I need to know from people, you know, and everything exactly what it's going to cost and things. But I think now was a really good opportunity that we have because there's a lot of things going on downtown that maybe would help, we would help our town. We could do it for it. Well, Ben and I have been talking about this for some time behind the scenes, and, and I know as soon as we get all the hard numbers, I'll put this on the agenda for discussion about if we want to pursue it further. Um, I know Ben's getting all the information, and uh, I'm sure we'll uh, have it soon. Because I'm afraid it's so easy for us to just let it go. Oh, we I completely understand. Because we know it's a concern, and so I really don't want to let it go. Well, thank you. Is there anything else for the go, oh, Ben? Just a reminder to the council that our uh, council retreat is scheduled for the 19th. And I know we've got League of Oregon Cities here on the 17th, if I'm not mistaken, at, uh, at the uh, Coke Hill Valley Hospital. Correct. It's uh, open to the public, uh, and uh, you know anybody's glad to come and listen and just see what we're all up to. We're going to be talking about public safety and mental health treatment funding, uh, in particular, in particular uh, jail bed space at county jails, which has been such a big issue in our region of the state. And I also want to say uh, my gracious, uh, accept the gracious invitation to Kathy Simonetti of the Chamber to present my State of the City address uh, at their event on February 27th, where I'm going to outline my policy priorities for the year and uh, where I think we need to be going. So uh, it's been a pleasure to be there the last few years, and it's a great event. I encourage everybody to show up and support the Chamber, and they've really stepped up, and they're doing a lot more in the community, so you know, show them your support. Uh, all right, then, if there's nothing else, we're adjourned at 814.
Are you keeping these or are we putting them in the record with Renee? Yeah. Thank you.